Good evening. My name is Seamus Igo, and I'm a Kevin B. Harrington Student Ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students of the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this evening's event. The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Before we begin for this evening's program, I would just like to remind you to turn off any cell phones or other devices that make noise. Tonight's speaker, Daryl West, is Vice President of Governance Studies and Director of the Center of, for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. He holds the Douglas Dillon Chair in Governance Studies. Previously, he was the John Hazen White Professor of Political Science and Public Policy and Director of the Taubman Center for Public Policy at Brown University. His current research focuses on technology, policy, healthcare, and education. West is the author of 20 books, including Billionaires, Reflections of, on the Upper Crust, Digital Schools, The Next Wave Using Digital Technology to Further Social and Political Innovation, Brain Game, Rethinking U.S. Immigration Policy, Digital Medicine, Healthcare, and the Internet Era. He is the winner of American Political Science uh, Association's Don K. Price Award for Best Book on Technology for uh, Digital Government and uh, the American Political Science Association's Doris Gaber Award for the best book on political communications for crosstalk. He has delivered nearly 150 lectures in dozens of different countries, including China, Japan, Russia, Taiwan, Mexico, Brazil, Germany, Netherlands, Portugal, Turkey, Bahrain, and the United States, and has been quoted in leading newspapers, radio stations, and national television networks around the world. Tonight, Mr. West will be joining us for a discussion entitled Billionaires, Reflections on the Upper Crust. He will talk about the 2016 presidential campaign with emphasis on money, media coverage, and campaign strategy. Following Mr. West's remarks, we will have a brief question and answer period. Please wait until the student ambassador with the microphone reaches you for your question. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Darrell West. Thank you very much for that introduction, and thank you to all of you for uh, coming out tonight. It's nice to be uh, back at St. Anselm's. Uh, I was actually here the last time in 1980. I was writing a dissertation on the 1980 presidential campaign, and there was a big Republican debate in the old chapel here. I remember uh, coming and seeing lots of the candidates. And I have to say, at this point in the election cycle, it's fun to be in New Hampshire, as we know, you are the epicenter of the political universe. All we have to brag about in DC now is the Pope just came to town uh, this afternoon, but you have all the candidates. I understand you were supposed to have Scott Walker uh, be here tomorrow night. I guess that didn't work out so well for uh, Governor Walker since he now has uh, canceled his uh, campaign. Uh, but what I'd like to do is uh, talk about the uh, 2016 uh, campaign uh, and particularly uh, the role that money plays uh, in uh, this election, because we're certainly seeing a lot of big spending even this early in the campaign. We have a situation where a few dozen families have provided half of all the money that has been given to the various presidential candidates. We have the spectacle of a billionaire himself, Donald Trump, uh, who is running for office. And by the way, this is not unusual. When I was doing the research for my book, Billionaires, I found that there are more than a dozen different countries where billionaires have run for office. And most of the time, they actually end up uh, winning. I'm not necessarily predicting that for Mr. Trump, but uh, certainly the, the global uh, situation suggests uh, that uh, they have a certain credibility. And so the question that I'd like to address is what does all this mean? What does it tell us about our political system? What are the possible ramifications and problems for our system of democracy? And how is it going to affect this particular presidential campaign? As someone who studies campaigns and elections, I'm very concerned about what has been happening. Uh, and so one of the reasons I wrote the book was to really kind of delve into this issue and kind of think about uh, what all this uh, means. Uh, I wrote the book in part because I was curious about billionaires. Uh, 
and wanted to know uh, who they are, how they got rich, and what are they doing with their immense uh, wealth. I also wanted to know what are they like as individuals. Uh, between teaching at Brown University for 26 years and now being at Brookings for seven years, I've had encounters with about 20 different billionaires. And so I think my experiences reveal interesting tidbits about their mentality and their uh, viewpoints. I was actually visiting a billionaire friend of mine in Palm Beach a few years ago. And of course, he has this beautiful uh, mansion uh, right on uh, the ocean. And one Saturday morning, we were sitting out on his uh, front uh, patio uh, overlooking the water. It's a very calm and peaceful setting. And this helicopter, very noisily and flying very low, just goes right down uh, the coast. And so I looked at my friend and asked, well, what's up with that? And he said, oh, that's my neighbor. Instead of driving the two miles down to the golf course, he likes to take his helicopter. Uh, and so I thought that was a very interesting case of kind of billionaires annoying other uh, billionaires. But I've also had some experience, as you see here, uh, with billionaires annoying me. Uh, for some strange reason, my life in several different respects has intersected with uh, Mr. Uh, Trump. Uh, my first experience with him uh, dates back to 2008, uh, around the time when there was speculation that Donald Trump would be speaking before the Republican National Nominating Convention. And so Politico, the DC-based newspaper, interviewed me about how I thought about that. And I made what I admit is a very smart-ass comment. I said something like, Republicans should send Trump on an all-expenses trip around the world because if he actually speaks at that convention, he will bring the party nothing but trouble. So, you know, I didn't think so much about that quote, uh, but the morning the quote appeared, I got a call from Trump's personal assistant asking for my email address, which I gave to her. Now, Trump himself does not do email, but shortly thereafter, his assistant sent me a missive from Mr. Trump himself, in which he basically pasted what I had said about him in the newspaper, and then he wrote in big uh, black uh, bold letters, and here's a copy of the uh, email, Daryl, you are a fool. Best wishes, Donald J. Trump. And by the way, I did appreciate the best wishes uh, there. Now, at the time, I thought I was special, but I didn't realize he was going around calling everybody fools, losers, uh, and uh, whatever. Uh, we've seen a lot of that uh, in uh, this uh, campaign. But then I had another encounter with Donald Trump uh, last year. Uh, after my book came out, as part of the promotion for that, uh, Brookings put out a billionaire political power index in which we rated, I think it was the top 25 American billionaires in terms of their impact on the 2014 uh, midterm elections. And we uh, rated Donald Trump number 23. And so a few weeks after the index uh, came out, I'm sitting at my desk and our phones have uh, caller ID. The phone rings and on the caller ID, it says Trump Org. And I'm thinking, no, it cannot be. But I answered the phone and it was not Trump uh, calling, but Michael Cohen, who's his executive vice president and special counsel, so you know, very uh, big guy within the Trump organization, was calling to complain about the ranking. He wanted to know how we possibly could have ranked Donald Trump number 23 when he clearly deserved to be in the top two, three, or four. And so we had a very fun 20-minute conversation talking about the ranking and uh, so on. So it's just been weird how I've had these encounters with Trump and then now he's uh, running for uh, president. Although, by the way, having written a book on billionaires, the fact that he's running for president has been really good for business. So I actually appreciate uh, that aspect of it. But the very first billionaire who I met was at Brown University, and he in part propelled my book on billionaires, and that is uh, Ted Turner, who you see uh, right here. About 20 years ago, Ted Turner came to Brown to give a lecture uh, that uh, we uh, organized, and we uh, hosted him, and he came with his then wife, Jane Fonda. So, of course, this was a very big deal for the university and attracted a lot of attention. You know, it's a very uh, glitzy occasion. But in his remarks, he said something that really stuck with me over the years, and I uh, put it here on the screen. He said, the first million is the hardest. After that, money begets money, and everything is easier. And basically what he was saying was, once you have money, and you kind of get into social, political, and economic networks, wealth creation is easy, because you can use your contacts to uh, generate additional money. 
And I thought about that, that comment a lot during the 2012 presidential campaign uh, because we saw a number of super wealthy individuals spend an enormous amount of money attempting to defeat President Obama. So we had Charles and David Koch who spent more than $100 million uh, trying to defeat uh, Obama, obviously unsuccessful. Uh, Sheldon Adelson was very active in support of Newt Gingrich during the Republican nominating process, and then he supported Mitt Romney uh, during the general election. Uh, on the more moderate to liberal side, uh, we've had a number of billionaires become very politically active. Uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, has uh, been very uh, active on immigration reform, uh, fighting gun violence, and uh, fighting uh, obesity uh, through uh, you know, soda taxes and uh, taxes on uh, sugar uh, consumption. Uh, George Soros, of course, is a very uh, prominent liberal uh, billionaire who funds a lot of grassroots uh, organizations uh, in this area. And then Tom Steyer is someone who's not as well known as these other individuals, but in recent campaigns, he has put a lot of money behind the cause of climate change. He's worried about climate change. Uh, in the 2014 midterm election, for example, he spent about $65 million of his own money just trying to raise public awareness of uh, that issue. And by the way, of course, he failed. Uh, you know, it was a Republican uh, year. Uh, there's no public opinion survey evidence that the public uh, is uh, more uh, concerned uh, about that issue now than uh, a year ago. And as I mentioned before, this issue of billionaire activism is not just a US uh, thing. When you look around the world, we've seen numerous examples of billionaires running for office and being very successful. One of the most uh, famous examples was in Italy, uh, Silvio uh, Berlusconi. Uh, Okay, it's not advancing, but I'll just uh, continue anyway. Uh, we have it, the example of the new president of Ukraine, uh, Poroshenko, who is a, a billionaire. He made his money off of uh, uh, making uh, chocolate. And so when you kind of think about what's happening both in the United States as well as globally, we're seeing all of these billionaires become uh, politically active, and they're really putting a lot of money trying to influence uh, the uh, political uh, process. And so in the book, I talk about what I call the wealthification of politics and kind of what it means. Because we're seeing big money come into politics, we're seeing big money affect the world of finance, the world of economics, big money is affecting universities, it's affecting, it's affecting uh, think tanks, it's affecting a wide range of civic organizations. So we need to start thinking about the consequences of, of the wealth and in the political arena, uh, the political activism uh, that we are uh, now seeing. There are about eight, uh, 1,800 known billionaires around the world, according to uh, Forbes magazine. About one third of them uh, live in the United States. 90% uh, of them are, uh, are male, 60% uh, are white, uh, the average age is 63, so if you haven't hit your billion yet, don't worry, it's not too late, especially the young people here, you have plenty of time to uh, build your wealth. But the thing that I was really worried about is when you look at the current situation, there are several factors that have come together to create uh, serious uh, problems. Uh, one of the slides I was going to show, uh, I have a chart that looks at income concentration, basically the percent of wealth that the top 1% in the United States uh, has been able to earn between 1913 and uh, 2012, so roughly the last uh, century. And what we see is basically the curve starts high, then it dips down, and then it comes back. Uh, in uh, uh, 1928, we reached the high point of income concentration that the top 1% earned 21% of all of the income in America. But then after World War II, uh, 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 the income concentration dropped down to 8%. That was a low point. That was in 1976. Uh, also the year that I happened to uh, graduate from college, so I had no idea what a great time of opportunity that was just from the standpoint of income concentration. But then of course, when we look over the last 30 years, the income concentration has gone uh, way back up. Uh, it's now back to a 20%, so it's roughly at the same level as what we saw in the 1920s. And so we're seeing politicians uh, talk about inequality. Uh, the Pope uh, is talking about inequality both in the United States as well as around the world. So there's been a lot of attention uh, to that. 
And when you think about the political implications of this, uh, billionaires and wealthy people in the top 1% have political views that are different from that of the uh, general public. Uh, there was a very uh, innovative survey by uh, Ben Page, uh, Larry Bartels, and Jason Seawright uh, looking at this, where they compared the policy views of the top 1% compared to uh, the general public. And in general, uh, these uh, wealthy individuals displayed political uh, views that were much more conservative than the American public at large. Uh, you can kind of look at Medicare, you can look at uh, views about uh, spending on schools, uh, you can look at tax policy, you can look at the role of government, you can look at views about regulatory uh, policy, you can look at health care. On all of these issues, the top 1% have distinctive views and generally prefer a more limited role for uh, government. And so when you kind of think about uh, the consequences of all this, it becomes a problem when we also have a weak news media. And when you think about what has been happening to the American news media over the last uh, 10 to 20 years, typically, when you kind of think about uh, theories of democracy, the news media can act as a counterweight to large wealth by exposing corruption, uh, talking about conflicts of interest, kind of talking about some of the negative uh, ramifications that flow from uh, great wealth. But over the last couple of decades, the American news media has lost a lot of power. Uh, certainly when you look at what happened during the Great Recession, uh, many newspapers uh, got almost completely uh, wiped out. Virtually every newspaper that used to be you know, 40 or 50 pages is now one third or maybe even a half of its uh, typical size. A lot of the experienced reporters have been uh, laid off. There's been a lot of downsizing in the industry. And so it's been very difficult for the media to play that role uh, that we need in any democratic system of kind of acting as a check and balance on uh, uh, the rest of the system. And so when you look at all these factors coming together, billionaire activism, uh, the growing income concentration that we see, uh, the distinctive and conservative political views that uh, uh, the top 1% have, and the absence of countervailing institutions such as the news media to act as a check and balance, that is like a perfect storm for any uh, democratic system. And so it's been interesting to watch how some of these issues are playing out in the 2016 uh, presidential uh, campaign. Uh, because we're seeing even Republicans now talk about income equality, which they did not do so much of in the 2012 uh, presidential election, uh, but it now is on their radar. Uh, people are kind of linking uh, income inequality to uh, the future of the economy, uh, that in any capitalist system we know that in order for uh, any system uh, to operate well, uh, that we need markets, we need customers, that we need people who can buy the goods and services. And so when you kind of think about the uh, Trump campaign, he's been very interesting from the wealth standpoint because when you look at wealthy individuals who have run for office in the United States, and if you look at wealthy individuals who've run uh, for office in other countries, the particular appeal that they often have is they are seen and they often present themselves as white knights who are too rich to be bought. That's kind of the classic argument. And Trump himself has uh, made this argument in uh, this uh, campaign. In an era of massive political cynicism about politicians, like most people think politicians are corrupt, they're in it for themselves, uh, they're you know, in bed with uh, various uh, economic uh, interests, they're not looking out for the middle class and the uh, general uh, public. That when somebody comes from outside the political world, someone who's been successful in the business world, someone who is very rich, those individuals can gain great credibility through this phenomenon that <clears throat> they are too rich to, to be uh, bought. But at the same time, so we've seen evidence of like billionaires doing well uh, uh, through uh, that type of appeal. But at the same time, we also see the backlash against billionaires and the backlash against big money coming into the process. Because Trump's success, at least until recently, has been one of the big stories. But the other big story has been Bernie Sanders and the fact that he's done very well here in New Hampshire. He's been doing well in Iowa. Uh, in uh, some places, he's been uh, leading Hillary Clinton. Uh, some places, he's uh, fallen uh, back a little bit. But his performance has been a real shock. 
In fact, if we didn't have the Trump story over the last few months, the big story would have been Sanders uh, gaining, uh, uh, if not exceeding, uh, the political popularity of Hillary Clinton. And so that's kind of an example of the backlash against big money, kind of the fear that the system is rigged, uh, that the middle class is not doing well, that our uh, system of public policy is not well balanced, and we need to make some changes to invest in education, invest in healthcare, and make it possible for working class kids uh, to do well and, and kind of fulfill the uh, American dream. Uh, we've seen uh, interesting illustrations of the role that money can play in this uh, campaign. On the Republican side, uh, Jeb Bush has the fundraising advantage, uh, but we also see that that has not really helped him in the polls, uh, because even though he has money on his side, he's raised more than uh, $100 uh, million, uh, he has languished in the surveys because he's been a terrible candidate. You know, he's not done well in the debates, he's not been very articulate uh, on in some of his uh, personal appearances. And so money can affect the process, but it doesn't necessarily determine the process. So we see kind of interesting examples from uh, this campaign in terms of how it's going to uh, play out. It's been a pretty crazy campaign so far. We've already seen uh, lots of surprises. And of course, it's only September, uh, which means there are still many more uh, surprises that are going to come along uh, before uh, you uh, vote uh, in uh, February. It's been a pretty unpredictable process, especially on the Republican side, because there have been so many candidates. I mean, there were uh, 17. We're now uh, down two with the exit of uh, Walker and uh, Rick uh, Perry. But I'm kind of viewing this almost like an NCAA basketball tournament, you know, where you start with uh, 64 uh, teams and eventually you get down to the Sweet 16, but then the goal is the Final Four and then the championship uh, game. And so I think when you kind of think about the conflicting roles of money, media, and message in this uh, campaign, we need to be thinking about, okay, who are the four candidates who are going to be left standing on the Republican side? And my answer is I have no clue uh, who those particular four are going to be, but we can certainly start to think about categories of types of candidates who might end up uh, doing uh, very well uh, in uh, this uh, system. Uh, we have the clear uh, anti-establishment and the unconventional uh, candidates, uh, the territory occupied by uh, uh, Trump, uh, Ben Carson, and uh, now uh, Carly uh, Fiorina. Uh, that clearly is a niche. And so one of those candidates, and possibly two of them, uh, could end up emerging in uh, the Republican uh, Final Four. I would think that one of the governors uh, would end up doing well. So this could be a John Casey. Chris Christie has not done well up to this uh, point, but it is uh, still uh, early. It could be, uh, there could be a slot for the establishment Republican, uh, which previously would have been uh, Jeb Bush, uh, but Marco Rubio also occupies uh, that space. Or there could be a slot for a female slash minority uh, uh, place in the Final Four, which could be a Ben Carson or a Carly uh, Fiorina. So when you kind of think about a large field, you kind of have to think about the dynamics within the field, who has the potential to end up in that Final Four, and then what role will money, media, and message uh, play in deciding uh, the ultimate outcome. So I think 2016 will be very interesting just in terms of how it plays out and how it illustrates some of these broader themes uh, that we've seen uh, develop over uh, the past uh, few election cycles. So why don't I uh, stop at this point? I'd be happy to take any uh, questions or comments uh, that you have. Uh, could be about the billionaire's book, could be about Donald Trump, could be about the 2016 uh, presidential campaign. I know you are all experts on the campaign since you're living it up close and personal. Yes, we have a question back here. Uh, billion, a billion dollars is a lot of money. It is. And some of these guys have taken billion. It's starting to be billion. Are they going to be willing to and the Koch brothers have $84 billion between the two of them. And how much are they giving? I mean, $100 million doesn't seem like a lot. It's a lot to the candidate, but uh, they got a lot of money to throw around. And I wonder about these new young billionaires that uh, just graduate and hit the big lottery in Silicon Valley. Are they contributors? Because these are all older gentlemen. Uh, let me take each of those uh, two uh, questions uh, separately. In terms of uh, the amount of money that they're uh, contributing, 
This year, the Koch brothers and the network uh, of donors that they have assembled has already pledged to spend $889 million, so you know, virtually a, a billion dollars on uh, this campaign. Uh, we're expecting this to probably be at least a $6 billion campaign overall. So basically, they're going to produce one-sixth of the overall uh, total. And so Democrats, of course, are very worried that this is going to be an election that turns out to be the opposite of what we saw in 2012, where conservative billionaires spent a lot of money, but Obama was able to appeal to the middle class voter and uh, the idea that you know he cared more about the average person than Mitt Romney did and was able to defeat the big money. In 2016, the fear that Democrats have is that big money actually is going to win. So for example, one of the things that uh, these uh, billionaires did after 2012, you know, these are all smart uh, business guys, they knew that they failed, they went back and studied their failure. You know, in my book I analyzed how these people made a lot of their money, and in a surprising large number of cases, many of these people who ultimately became billionaires actually had a lot of business failures early in their life, but unlike other people who give up after you fail once, they would study what they did wrong, they would make corrective uh, changes, and then they went on to a great financial success. So in the case of the conservative billionaires in 2012, they studied what they did wrong, and they have done several things differently uh, since then. So for example, one thing uh, they thought they uh, got wrong was on the messaging and how they communicated with the American public. In 2012, they often ran ads that were dry and statistical and analytical and talked about the problem of the large debt uh, facing the United States, uh, how unfair that was to the next generation, how this in the long run was going to bankrupt America. They concluded that that was just simply too dry of a presentation for the average voter. And so if you look at what they did in the 2014 midterm elections, they ran Harry and Louise style advertising campaigns where they would put ordinary folks around a kitchen table or in a living room, and they would just talk about the problems they were facing. Problems they faced in terms of Obamacare, the difficulty of making a living, uh, high taxes. And so you had like the credibility of ordinary people presenting a very personal message, and they got much better results in 2014. If you look at each of those close Senate races, almost every one of them uh, uh, were places where uh, these wealthy individuals uh, spent a lot of money and in virtually every one of those states, uh, the Republicans won, and uh, money was a big part of why uh, Republicans uh, did well. So the fear of Democrats is that what we saw in 2014 actually could be the precursor of uh, what happens in uh, 2016. Now, on the second part of your question about the young billionaires, they are distinctive. They're kind of edging their way into the political process. Most of them, uh, uh, and by them I mean kind of the tech entrepreneurs uh, from uh, Silicon Valley, the Mark Zuckerbergs, and uh, so on, most of them are actually not putting a lot of money yet into electoral politics, but they are putting money into policy advocacy. So for example, on uh, immigration reform, Mark uh, Zuckerberg was one of the leading uh, contributors of an immigration reform organization. Uh, so he put a lot of money in that. He's been very interested in reforming schools, so he's uh, uh, invested a lot of money uh, there as well. So what the young entrepreneurs are doing so far is focusing more on public policy as opposed to elections. The older people think elections matter. Like if you win the election, then the policy is going to flow from that. Uh, and so one of the questions to watch over the next 10 years is whether the young billionaires eventually kind of uh, uh, get clued in on that message and start acting uh, more like the older billionaires and directly start uh, contesting elections. Yep, right there. Hey, <clears throat> two questions. Every time I see a Georgia Pacific paper towel dispenser, I think of the Koch brothers who own Georgia Pacific. Uh, can you expound on ALEC, the American Legislative Exchange Council, where the coach have gone in, I think, 34 states now, drafted the same legislation from state to state to state, where they're basically trying to take over every state legislature. And you don't hear too much about ALEC at all. Um, so that's one question. Uh, the other one, let me answer that question, and then you can ask your uh, second question, because otherwise I'll forget the first question. Uh, in my book, I have a chapter on billionaire political activism at the state and local level. 
Because nationally, in American politics, it's been hard for either side to do well, just because of political polarization, uh, the gridlock, you know, it's hard to get Congress to uh, pass uh, anything, you know, liberal or conservative. But what a lot of these billionaires have done is they have found a much more receptive arena at the state and local level. Because if you think about many American states today, a lot of states have basically become one-party states. Like California is a one-party state now. Like Democrats dominate uh, California. There are a lot of uh, 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 certainly southern and now midwestern states and, and also places like uh, North Carolina uh, that are, have almost become one-party states in the opposite direction. That Republicans have done very well, they have the governorship, uh, they have the uh, state and the house, and they are implementing a very conservative agenda in those particular states. So the organization that you mentioned, uh, Ali, is a conservative lobbying group that basically is active in public policy at the state level and they often write bills, uh, give it to legislators. You know, most state legislators don't have big staffs. They don't have time to kind of do their own research and draft their own legislation. And so if an organization comes along and says, you know, you're concerned about issue X, like here's a model piece of legislation, we have seen evidence of uh, legislators actually taking those bills, introducing them, and in many cases, uh, the legislation has been enacted. The only thing I don't understand about that is why there hasn't been a liberal counterpart uh, to Alec. There have actually been a couple of efforts to develop that, and for whatever reason, it's just it has not been uh, successful. So in the book, I argue that where you see the clearest example of billionaire political influence is not at the national level, at least to this point, but at the state and local level. In some localities, you've seen like the Koch brothers have invested money in city council races, in school board elections, and you know if you invest you know one or two million dollars like in the Columbus, Ohio uh, city council race, that's big money. You know that's like equivalent to maybe investing a hundred million dollars uh, in a uh, presidential uh, campaign. But that's exactly what people are doing. And that stuff often flies under the radar because there hasn't been nearly as much news coverage of that type of political activism. Yeah, the other question was about uh, the fiasco with Citizens United uh, and the dark money that's allowed under the Citizens United ruling. What's to prevent a foreign country from, well, we're not going to reveal our names, the donors don't have to. Suppose China wanted to get a Manchurian candidate type of person running for office or a number of offices. Uh, there's, what, what is a provision or is there a way to keep foreign money out of U.S. elections? The rise of dark money has been, in my view, the biggest blight on American democracy in recent years. In the sense that, uh, I remember after Watergate, we adopted campaign finance rules that limited the amount of money that rich people could donate to any individual candidate. Uh, there were limits on what could be given to political parties. There were very strong disclosure requirements, so if you did give money, you had to uh, disclose you know, what you did and how much uh, you gave. Over the last 30 plus years, one by one, each of those particular provisions got stripped away. Citizens United was part of that, but it wasn't the only uh, uh, legal case uh, that came about. We now are in a situation that is almost a complete wild west, where there's unlimited spending, great secrecy, and that is a terrible combination for any democratic system. That is actually the system that we had right before Watergate that produced the Watergate uh, scandals. So uh, the good news is oftentimes in that situation where there's big money coming in in secret, it's such a breeding ground for great scandal that there's always the potential that people will be too greedy, they will overreach, they will do things, uh, and it'll backfire on them, and then it'll mobilize uh, the public. But there's the second interpretation that maybe our system is at a point where so many problems have come together, the inequality, the poor media coverage, the legal uh, cases, and the big money that's coming into the political process, that maybe this could actually become the perfect storm where democracy gets completely eroded and you know we kind of 
includes uh, some of the uh, benefits uh, uh, that we uh, cherish. So, you know, those are things that uh, people should uh, definitely pay attention to. Other questions or comments? Do you have a question right here? Is there any sort of comparable movement that looks as though it could make a difference in the Citizens United and other dark money efforts at this point? How is the opposition doing? Meaning in terms of people who are concerned about the role of money in politics and are organizing around it? I know Larry Lesser's um, candidacy is one of those attempts, but is there a, any true movement that looks as though they might actually make a difference in this area? No. <laughs> Which is a disappointing answer to give because when you look at American history, when we have this type of situation where people feel there's a lot of corruption in the political process, there's big money, there's a lot of secrecy, and you just know that there are a lot of uh, deals uh, being cut to the detriment of the general public, in virtually every one of those eras, there was a social movement that came up to basically contest that situation. So we've had populist movements, we had the progressive movement in the early 20th century, uh, in the 1960s and, and into the 1970s, uh, there were various citizens of movements uh, that uh, actually produced real legislation. And, you know, we had campaign finance uh, reform and uh, we uh, uh, did other things. The biggest mystery for me as a political scientist who studies elections is why hasn't there been a comparable, effective social movement in this time period? Now, we've had some efforts to do that, like Occupy Wall Street was an effort. It was completely amateurish, they were completely ineffective, and they died away after a few months. Uh, we have Larry Lessig, the Harvard professor, who uh, wants to run for president on the single issue of campaign finance reform. We do have Bernie Sanders, who now has gained some traction in the Democratic uh, primary, uh, in part by uh, trying to uh, attract attention uh, to uh, these uh, issues, but I don't think anybody thinks he's actually going to be the Democratic uh, nominee. And so, even though there have been efforts at social organizing around these issues, none of them have really been successful. And I think the thing that is really distinctive about this time period is the massive citizen cynicism. People see the problems. Like, if you look at public opinion polls, you know, there are like 75% of Americans will agree that there are problems X, Y, and Z in how our democracy is operating. But they are so cynical about this that they also have concluded there's nothing they can do. Nothing's going to change. Nothing is ever going to get better. That basically all the problems we have with American democracy today, we're stuck with. And we, uh, we just simply can't do any better. That's different from, say, the progressive era, where people were upset with the political status quo, but they organized and they thought they could make a difference, and they did make a difference. They enacted policies that kind of rolled back uh, some of that. So I think when future historians look back on this, this is going to be one of the mysteries. Like, why didn't that happen in this era? And is it reversible? You know, maybe it hasn't happened at this point, but it could happen. Maybe we just need another Watergate-style scandal to, to really uh, galvanize uh, things. Um, but it's an interesting uh, question. Yes, in the very back. Uh, I wanted to ask what um, Barack Obama and both of his campaigns and Bernie Sanders, it can be said, are pretty successful at raising lots of small donations instead of solely relying on just billionaires, as Bernie Sanders likes to advertise, what are they doing that's you know, effective or working for them that you know, other more conservative candidates are, don't want to do in their campaigns? I mean, this is one possible hopeful sign about our current system. Because on the one hand, we have a lot of big money that is, to some extent, dominating uh, the process. But there is a possible counterweight if you can get a bunch of small donors to kind of come together, support uh, particular candidates, and help that individual do well with a, a different kind of uh, political agenda. There actually have been three candidates who have been very successful at mobilizing small uh, donors. Uh, two of them you named, uh, Barack Obama, uh, Bernie Sanders is now doing it. Ron Paul, when he ran for president uh, as, as a libertarian, was also somebody who did that. 
Now, when you look at those three individuals, what allowed them to successfully mobilize small donors, uh, at least in my view, is they were able to tap into a grassroots sentiment that allowed them uh, to do very well with small uh, donors. Because to be successful with that strategy, you have to be saying the right things, but you also have, have to be a certain type of individual that people can trust and have confidence in and think that that's the type of individual who actually could make a difference despite all the systemic uh, barriers uh, that we uh, face. So there certainly are examples of individuals who have been successful on the small donor front, but uh, virtually every other candidate who's tried to do that has been unsuccessful. Like Hillary Clinton is not really uh, doing it, Jeb Bush certainly is not doing it, uh, Marco Rubio is not uh, doing it. I mean, most of the other conventional candidates have not demonstrated success in doing that. I was wondering, uh, what do people want that give big money? Uh, what are they after? Influence? Or they just like one better, more than the other? And it uh, just seems like there's so much money they could throw at it that they could win. <laughs> uh, they want two things when they're making uh, contributions, access and influence. Access is basically getting in to see the people who are making decisions so that you can present your case. Now, there's no guarantee that you're necessarily going to win out, but you get hurt. Uh, your calls get returned. You know, if you're a big contributor to uh, various senators and there's, you know, some policy issue uh, that has come up and you want to talk to the senator and explain why he or she should uh, vote a certain way, they will take a meeting with you. They will take a phone call. They will read uh, the letter uh, that you write. So access is part of it. And then the hope is that the access will convert in influence, that you can actually alter uh, the vote or get them to do something um, that would uh, reflect your point of view. We've actually seen examples of this in the Senate, particularly during this era of polarization and gridlock, because uh, many of you know that it's very easy to stop the Senate from doing things uh, through a filibuster uh, because you need 60 votes to cut off debate and in a polarized era it's almost impossible to get 60 votes behind anything uh, and so the possibility of any one member of the Senate merely threatening to filibuster regardless of whether that person actually does it is often enough to stop legislation and the second thing uh, that is uh, that is we're seeing in the Senate is one senator can block consideration of an appointment by putting a secret hold on that nomination. So let's say the president nominates someone for uh, an agency uh, position. Uh, all you have to do is one member of the Senate can basically secretly tell the majority leader, I want to put a hold on that individual's appointment. The full Senate cannot consider uh, that appointment. And so what wealthy interests have discovered is in the Senate, you only need one person. Like, you don't have to buy 50 people or 30 people or even 10 people. If you buy one and that person sits on the relevant committee in your area of interest, that's all that you need because that person can use the threat of a filibuster to stop legislation. You can use secret holds to stop appointments from going forward. And there actually have been examples of where uh, this has happened. So it's that combination of access and influence. That's what people are going for. I just show a little competition on the Democratic side. This, you know, on this election cycle, I mean, there's only two candidates running where there's 16 Republicans. And I assume that's because Hillary is, is considered the favorite, but it seems, why is that? I'm just, that's the question. Well, we actually have five Democrats running, but three of them you probably haven't heard of. So uh, I, I, I can see why you think there's uh, two. On the Republican side, we now have uh, 15. We used to have uh, 17. Uh, and it, it, the reason there are a lot of candidates is it's an open field election in the sense that there's no president uh, running for re-election, or at least as of right now, no vice president attempting to succeed uh, that president. But you're also right on the Democratic side that even though supposedly it's an open election, it's really not so open because Hillary Clinton essentially preempted the field. So like 
there are a bunch of other people who actually wanted to run for uh, president. I mean, Andrew Cuomo, the governor of New York, uh, certainly uh, thought about it, uh, and, and there were others as well. Uh, but when they saw Hillary came out, she had a lot of institutional support, she raised a lot of uh, money early, so they simply chose not to run. So that's how we've kind of ended up on the Democratic side with two major candidates. But that's actually good for Bernie Sanders because he, now that he's become the alternative to her, he can capture all of the anti-Clinton sentiment uh, within uh, the Democratic Party. If there were more serious candidates, the anti-Clinton vote would be split among two, three, or four alternatives, and that would actually be much easier for her to win that election. Her overall total might be lower, but her, the size of her plurality would be bigger, uh, which would be good for her in terms of uh, getting momentum towards the actual nomination. To, to follow up on that, is there a, um, a, co a comparable amount of money and billionaires on the Democratic side as there are on the Republican side? And are we seeing head-to-head -head conflicts um, with the money going into the same issue with you know two billionaires basically fighting? Are we seeing any instances of that? There are liberal, moderate, conservative, and libertarian billionaires. But when you look at the billionaires who are politically active, much of that money is skewed to the Republican side. So for example, in 2012, if you look at the contributions to super PACs, which was kind of the major vehicle for the big money to come into the campaigns. These were typically people who were giving $100,000 or more to an individual uh, candidate, a super PAC. 80% of that money came in on the Republican side, not the Democratic side. This year, I think there will be a better balance, but the balance could be like two-thirds Republican, one-third Democrat. Part of the reason is there are very rich Democrats and liberal billionaires like Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Mark Zuckerberg, but these individuals, at least so far, have not chosen to put their money into elections. They're putting their money into public policy, and Bill Gates puts a lot of money into uh, education. Uh, Warren Buffett is worried about global health. Mark Zuckerberg has put money into immigration reform. But none of them have really put a lot of money into uh, the election part. Even George Soros, in 2004, he put a lot of money into organizations that were contesting the George W. Bush uh, re-election, but then he lost, and then he got kind of cynical about the, the political use of his money, and he made a decision to put money into grassroots organizations that were fighting on particular issues, or you know, they might be involved in get out the vote efforts, but he has not actually put that much money into contesting candidate elections. Uh, and so it's not that there aren't liberal billionaires, but they're choosing to do more policy advocacy than electoral advocacy. And on the issue of electoral competition, the thing that ultimately could save America is the fact that we have 500 billionaires. And on any one issue, you could have conservatives spending a lot of money, but then there could be liberal counterweights who could spend on the other side. And so there could be some uh, relative uh, balance of uh, power. But you know, if you end up with elections where conservative billionaires are put in, putting a lot of money into the election, and the liberal billionaires are, not, are, are doing policy advocacy as opposed to electoral advocacy, you lose that competition, you lose what could be a, a balance of power uh, between the uh, two sides. And then when you move to the state level, when billionaires put money in, it's almost always one-sided. Uh, and it's easy to put you know, four or five million into a, a state or local issue, and oftentimes there's no money on the other side. So that becomes almost completely a, a one-sided. I have what may be a naive uh, attitude about campaign contributions, but I think if all campaign contributions were outlawed, the NRA would not be able to threaten congressmen 
after the Sandy Hook travesty, we would have had at least regulations on who's going to be able to buy guns and regulate gun shows and internet. But none of that happens, even though 90% of Americans want some kind of gun control. So if we could outlaw campaign finance, it's, it's illegal. You can't give 10 cents to anybody running for office. It'll all be federally funded, bingo. I think it would clean up democracy. Is that a naive view? Uh, it's naive in the current context just because of Supreme Court decisions. I mean, that would clearly be found unconstitutional by the current Supreme Court. So if you want to pursue that strategy, you have to get a different Supreme Court. With a different Supreme Court, they might have different interpretations and they might find uh, those types of restrictions more acceptable. But the current court basically equates freedom of speech with freedom to spend, which in my view is a mistaken interpretation. And there have been earlier uh, generations of court decisions where we did not have that kind of legal interpretation. Uh, and it, certainly if you look at other Western democracies, Almost no democracy allows unlimited secret money to come into the process. Like when I lecture about American politics in European countries, they are astonished at the sheer magnitude of the money that is coming in and the fact that a lot of it is coming from a small number of individuals, very wealthy individuals, and that a lot of the money is coming in secret. Almost in none of those countries, England, France, Germany, and so on, do they allow that kind of behavior. Like they think, in elections, you need fair competition, and money is a big part of that, and so they regulate money. But because of our particular constitutional system and the particular interpretations that people have, people on the court have uh, given, we've gone a different route. But that means our democracy is facing very different risks than virtually any other Western Any other questions? Okay, maybe we'll take uh, one more question. So this will be the last one, so it has to be a really good question. <laughs> Not to pressure you or anything. Well, I, I think um, also, as, as you can see, you know, we're a very small audience tonight, and so I'm more concerned not only with the spending, which I think is, is, is out of line, obviously, but I'm also just concerned about the lack of knowledge of the voters and this democracy that we so cherish. And, you're, and I'm sure in your research, you probably have statistics on how educated the, the voters are. So that's what's very scary for someone like me. It concerns me that people aren't more engaged in the political process in general. Now, New Hampshire is a little different in the sense People here tend to be much more engaged than in other places, but certainly when you look around the country in terms of voter turnout rates and so on, it's really not the case. Like even in general, even in presidential general elections, you know we typically get 55 to 60 percent of, of people voting. In midterm elections, that figure is often 35 to 40 percent. So you know barely more than a third of the eligible voters are turning out to vote. And it's one of the reasons why we do a lot of work on kind of governance and democracy at Brookings. So one of the ideas that we're thinking about is uh, universal uh, voting. Uh, there are a number of Western uh, democracies around the world that basically people have to vote. If they don't vote, they face a small civil fine, like equivalent to a traffic ticket, like a $25 fine, a $35 fine, something like that. In those countries, turnout is often 85 to 90 percent and so it's a simple reform that actually produces big results and the reason why this actually could be helpful is not necessarily that you know that extra 30 percent of the people who might turn out to vote are smarter that probably is not the case but what what that change would do is right now our voting system contributes to the political polarization and the dysfunction that we see. Because if you only have you know, slightly more than half of the people turning out the vote, politicians have incentives to play to the base. Like if you can't mobilize the centrist voters and the undecided uh, voters in the middle, but you can mobilize liberals or conservatives, then that's what you do. 
Uh, and if the money is coming from real liberals or real conservatives, then the money kind of reinforces a move towards uh, more extremism as well. And so the virtue of a universal voting uh, system is we can get turnout up to 85 or 90 percent. Politicians will not be able to play to the base. Uh, like uh, Republicans will not be able just to focus on conservatives. Democrats will not be focusing uh, just on uh, liberals. That will help a lot with the polarization that we see. There's very much a tie between our election problems and the governing uh, problems uh, that we uh, face. Now, we don't believe that this is an idea that you know Congress is going to adopt tomorrow. But the way election reform often takes place is states and localities experiment with different things. You get four or five states doing this. If you start to get good results, then other states uh, pick up on it. Uh, and remember, our election system is run at the state and local level. So states are empowered to do uh, this. So they can certainly uh, implement this uh, reform. So that's an idea that we think actually could uh, make a difference in addressing uh, some of these issues. But, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming out. I appreciate all the questions. And if anyone is interested in books, uh, there's some uh, uh, books in back, and I'd be happy to sign. Thank you very much.